Hello and welcome to Soho Editors. Um, my name is Rory. Uh, thanks for coming along to this webinar. I'm going to show you some of the uh, very cool things that are in DaVinci Resolve uh, 16. Uh, as I say, I'm a, an advanced uh, um, a trainer on this, master trainer as they call it, on, on DaVinci Resolve. Soho Editors Training is an organization that uh, is an accredited training center for all the manufacturers. So um, we have lots of trainers in Avid and uh, in Cinema 4D and After Effects and so on. So, um, and we're also an accredited, we're also an agency for talent. So if you need an editor to be working on your project from re remotely, then yeah please visit the website and check out the talent that we've got there. Now, before I go on, if we're looking at the edit page in Resolve, I'm just gonna give you a slight introduction to the application first. So in uh, Resolve, we've got an end-to-end -end solution. So as far as I'm concerned, I've got the best technology, maybe my other trainers, the trainers in, in so that's training might disagree but hopefully you'll agree by the end of this experience. I'm gonna go through the fundamentals of the color page, but just to get us in the zone, we've got a media page, which allows us to do all our wrangling. We've got two cutting environments, editing pages. This is the one that most people are familiar with. We've also got Fusion, which is a compositing application, which allows us to do 3D compositing and particles and so on. Then we've got the color page, which we're gonna deep dive into and have a look at in detail. We've got the Fairlight page, which allows us to work our audio really closely, and it's a full on audio tool set. And then we've got delivery at the other end. So we've got a lot of functionality, end-to-end -end pipeline of all the tools, and they're all completely integrated with each other. So if I want to grade this shot, I simply go into the color page, and that's the shot that I'm working on now. Now, we've got a mini timeline here that represents the same as the timeline we've just seen in the edit page. So that can help us navigate, particularly useful when we see two layers above each other. I can see the top layer. If I hit the mix button, unmix button and select the bottom layer, I'll be able to see that. So that's a useful button for allowing us to see in context underneath layers. Going back a step, just to introduce you to the interface a little, we've got our gallery up in the top left here and that's where we store our live grades and stills that show us exactly what that grade is so that's a useful area we'll be using later we've got next to that if i hide that i can go to the lutz library and this allows me to audition different looks that i might want to use in the film i've got a media pool where i can get to all my content and bring that into this as i need to i've got the ability to hide and reveal that timeline. So I'll, I'll just hide that away for now. In the viewer, we've got various tools at the top here for pulling split screens to use these wipes. We'll be using that later. We've got a split screen tool. We've got a selection or highlight tool, which we'll be using too. Underneath it, we've got our viewer. We've got loop on. So if I press play, we can see that play through JKL, all work, all the na standard navigation tools work. We've got a tools bar here that allows us to switch to different tools, depending on what we're working on here in our tools, uh, we might need to switch to different ones of those. And then over here, we've got our node environment. So this is a node based uh, grading tool. So we've got the RGB from the timeline coming into the RGB of the node, coming out of that node and back into the timeline. So any nodes we put into this framework, um, will be um, feeding that grade back into the timeline. We can have as many nodes as we want and in as in any order that we want or arrangement that we want. To know, just to point out this node with it has within it all of the color grading tools underneath here. So I've got a full set of tools in every node. And as I say, I can organize them in whatever way I want. Um, with down below we've got our thumbnails and they're like the mini timeline they just allow me to navigate between shots i can use my up and down arrows to get to those shots if i right click on them i get a load of functionality as well for creating versions of different grades as i'm going along and getting closer to the prize when i see a color like that that means this has already had some sort of grading done on it now 
beneath that node, we've got our um, primary area for grading. The color primary wheels is where we normally would start off our grading. We've got lots of different menus here, but we start in here normally when we're doing our technical grade or balancing and matching part of a formula. Um, just to point out, we've got lift, gamma, gain in here, which is shadows, midtones, and highlights, and they massively overlap each other. So if I push red into the shadow area, you can see it's moving into the whites. It's going to influence each other. I can reset it here or reset the whole palette here. Take note that you've got different tools in that palette, depending on which dot you click on or which menu you choose here same with the curves if i look at the curves i've got lots of different color curves to work with we'll be using some of these later and of course i've got a drop down for all of those i'll explain what those naming conventions mean at some point as well and then over here we've got our uh, obviously we've got our qualifiers and windows and tracking and all those sorts of tools and then over on this side we've got our keyframing environment and our scopes environment too and these obviously help us drive the grade and control the grade so i'm just going to go through a series of shots building up to more complex things with, with this shot we've got a flat shot i want to see um it is as the contrast of the shot first in any grade. So to do that, I'm just gonna switch from parade to waveform in my scopes. There's my waveform. And if I click on that little icon there, I can adjust what I'm looking at. So I'll boost it so you guys can see it. I can tick to show extents, which will give me this specular detail of the, above the top. And if I go to the Y channel only, I'll lose all that com uh, complex overlapping of channels and I can just see the pure um, uh, contrast in the shot. I'll get rid of those extents for now. So if I want to drive the grade now, underneath each hue and saturation control in each brightness range, I've got contrast. So I can drive contrast into the shot and I can lift my white point and my black point to do that. I'll reset. To do in this shot, I'm just going to show you some of the automated function within Resolve. We've got some auto white balance and black balance tools, which can get you a, a head start on things. Just be aware if you set up button three on your mouse, you can use it to roll in on the picture. And if you hold down on it, you can move around. A really useful shortcut if you've done that and you want to get back out is Shift and Z, which will get you out to the wide. Now, this tool is designed to work on the brightest part of the picture. If I don't click on the brightest part, I'll get a result that I'm not necessarily expecting. So if I click on this top of the plane with my white pipette, I click on it, you'll see it overreact effectively to that click. And you see it's clipping the picture a little bit. But if I pull back on that, you can see I can recover all that detail. Now, if I want to, I can go to the black point. I'm gonna use this area here. It's quite neutral shadow area. So I'll pick up my black point and click under there. And you see it's done quite a nice job of just setting an initial starting point on this grade. Now I can clearly work that further by using my tools here. As it is for this one, I'm just gonna just drop in some saturation, punch in some saturation. So I'm getting those yellows to pop out as well. So nice little start to get us in the game. The next shot we're gonna look at is this one. Uh, it's a lovely baby rhino. I'm a big fan of wildlife, animal advocate. I like looking after rhinos. We need to look after them more. I'm just gonna set up an initial state on this shot where I'm gonna be quite careful on setting up a brightness to it. It is log, so it's obviously very flat. I've got to bring the life back into it. We could either calibrate, use our color, um, color management tools to do all this log work, but I can do it manually. Now, once I've got it reasonably safe within that record space, just get my I'll zoom out of the way. Now I'm gonna use the contrast controls in this primary wheels to just add contrast. And if you see when I drag contrast in, it actually starts scaling up from this 512 line and down from it. So it's, pay, it's, it's pivot point at the moment is in the middle of the shot. As soon as I bring that in, that's looking good. Maybe I'll take the mids down a little. And now I'll just add in a lot of saturation again, because again, it's been clipped. 
Now, uh, oh, it's been um, the saturation's not in the shot initially. Now that I've got that saturation there, obviously, we can see that there's a little bit of a problem cast in the shot. Um, and that magenta cast can be fixed in a number of ways. Now, in color theory, there's, there's essentially the complementary color, which is the other side of the wheel. So if I'm seeing a magenta cast, if I go to the brightness range where that mainly sits, which is in the highlight range, and I pull against it, you'll see I'm now neutralizing that color cast. Better scope to look at it with is the parade, because then if I just undo to get back to where I was, you can see the imbalance of the channels here. So as I start moving against that red channel, I neutralize the cast and you see I'm getting a much neutral balance on the shot. A better way of doing that might be to go to my second palette in this color wheels area, primary wheels area, which is my primary bars. Actually, these are one and the same thing. So if I push in red in my lift, when I go back to the wheels, you'll see that red push there. If I undo, it will be undone there and it will be undone in here. They're one and the same tool. But now I could go to my gain and just drive down just the red channel to remove that red cast a little bit, maybe add some blue or even remove blue to warm it up slightly and add some yellows back in. So you can see if I do now, I can click under the number to either turn that grade off to see before or after. Or indeed, there's a great shortcut, Command D will disable that node and turn it back on again. So you can see what you've done before and after. With this next shot, um, someone's already hit it with a, a, a grade, so they've done a balance node on it. I'm going to add a node to it so that I can work downstream. Actually, no, I'll do that on another shot. I'm going to just grab a still from this one at the moment. So I'll go back into my gallery because if I play through, if I turn off loop and play through, you can see this shot is supposed to work with that one in the same sequence and clearly shot at different times of day. So this is a problem you can have in grading all the time. Obviously, you've got to get a fundamental match and balance on all the shots if you want to group grade them together and deploy that grade at a group level. So it's a critical part of the process, and it's something we can do very easily in Resolve to get these two shots to match. So the process I'll do is I'll work, first I'll do is grab a reference frame from what I want to match to. So to do that, I'll right click in the viewer and go grab still. I can click under that still and call it my reference if I want to label it and be organized. And now if I want to use that still as my reference, I can park on the shot I want to use it and double click on the loop on the still to turn it on. Effectively, that's the button that turns on that wipe as well. Or you can use command W to turn on and off that wipe once you've loaded it. Now, with that wipe loaded, you can see that now I've got quite a good comparison. On one side, I've got the moving shot, and on the other side, I've got similar information that will help me drive the grade. The other thing you should notice about this wipe is that it's also represented in the parade, which is brilliant, because now I can see the imbalance of those channels. And if I can balance those channels up, then I'm going to get a very similar look across the grade. Now, one of the issues I have with this is when I do, if you see when I try and drive the green channel in the gain here, look what happens to the red and the blue channel. They will react to that and they'll move around in compensation with whatever adjustment I make on that green channel. And that's to try and protect you from clipping the picture. Um, but in this instance, it could be quite a frustrating behavior. I can turn it off by going to my Luma Mix control down here and just ramping that down to naught. And there you can see, as a result, uh, as a result, I can now drive that green channel and it's independent of the other channels. Now all I've got to do is match the channels. Now, one of the things that people find disconcerting, I'm going to set the black point down to the green where the green black point is and then bring it back up. It's an iterative process. You're always pushing and pulling on each channel to get it to fit. As I bring down the blue lift, I'm going to have to compensate for that by bringing up the blue gain. And you'll quite often see some quite scary pictures and colors turn up while you're doing this process, because of course, until you've finished getting those channels into alignment, you're going to discover lots of other colors along the way. 
I tend to just look at the parade and make sure I'm getting that in the game before I start looking up because there's really little point. But you can see now I'm already quite close to the match. If I go back here and play through, let's see how that's working. It's not too bad. I could add a bit more contrast into that shot. And if I want to carry on refining it, if I pull back up that white, I can also go back to my curves here and start adding different values in on a channel by channel basis. So if I thought I needed more red, I could pick up my white point controller for the red and just pull it across. You can see that's warming up the shot. I won't go that far. And maybe I'll go to the blue channel. I can bring in some yellows by just reducing that a little bit uh, and so on. So this is a tonal soft adjustment to all the blue pixel, the blue values in the shot. It's a really nice way of doing that subtle adjustment. So we can now obviously get through and that's looking a lot better. If I do option command D, you can see what we had before and what we've got to now. So very good for matching and balancing out that shot, which is clearly a fundamental part of the formula. Oh, I'll just hide my camera. Sorry, I've got a face for radio. You shouldn't be seeing that. I'll just get that out of the way. Good. So uh, I'll save you that pain. Right. Now on this next shot, if I press play, I'll just turn on loop. And we can see that we've got this lovely shot of a plane flying off into the background. We're going to do a look on this, sh this shot. Now, if I don't want to work on the node that's already there, I can right click on it and go to add node add serial and that will add me a node downstream of the original so anything i've done in here will be fed into here in this one i'm going to call it a look so i can right click and go node label and type look so i can tell everybody what i've done if i'm collaborating with this software with other editors in the collaboration environment with resolve someone can be grading the shots that are happening in the same timeline as the editor's working. So you can get that really tense, tight and collaborative environment in Resolve uh, and team up on the job. Now to make the look here, I'm just gonna go back and just isolate my red channel. This is a cross process look, which is a kind of a retro style look. And it relies on me creating complementary colors by adjusting the channels in different brightness ranges. So I'm gonna take the red channel. I'll go to the blue channel first and push that in actually. So I'm gonna add two points to the curve just by clicking on them. And then I'll push blue into the C. You can see the C now getting very blue. And I'll take it out of the sky. So it will start turning the sky sort of a yellowish color. So that's one part of the formula. And then I'll go to the red channel and do the opposite. So as I bring out red from the bottom, I'm gonna create the cyan in, in the C, which is a nice feel for the C. And I'll just bring red into the sky. So I'm getting that kind of burned sky look. Uh, and there you go. So we've created that look. I can do Command D to turn it on and off. I can go Shift uh, F which will take me to my cinema view, which you can still see in Zoom as far as I'm aware, and then I can see before and after. If I do Shift F again, I'll get back to my overall interface. Good. <coughs> no problem. So now if I go to the next shot, in this one, we've already got a grade done, Command D, see before, it's just a subtle balancing grade. And in this one, we're going to create another look, which is a uh, sort of bleach bypass look, which uh, with a sort of blue feel to it. The bleach bypass is describing a formula where you, you're effectively bypassing a, a cleaning the silver off the film in a lab process. So it's very organic. It actually essentially makes a high contrast black and white desaturated visual. So that's what I'm going to do. Again, I don't want to work on this node. The way I think of nodes is one task per node, if possible. So I'll add a node. Now, I did that with the shortcut option S, which gets you to add a serial node downstream of the one you've selected. So now I've got a complete set of tools. I've also set the tab key to my node label in, in my keyboard customization. So I can just hit tab and call this one the look. And there we go. Now in this one, I'll create that, that bleach pie pass look. So for that, I need to add contrast. Now, just to point out, if I add contrast at the moment, I'm driving the picture down. It's getting darker and darker. 
And that's because the pivot, most of the information's below that pivot. If I take the pivot earlier now or lower, I'm moving that pivot earlier on my scopes, lower on my scopes. So the scaling is happening, pushing it up. If I move the pivot up to the very top of my parade, all my contrast will drive it down, the darkness down into the shot. So I've set a nice moody environment. I now need to take out some saturation. So I'll desaturate to say 40%. Remember you can roll in and, and, and look at what you're getting in terms of skin tones, just to make sure you're not losing them all. And finally, I need that look. I'll just do shift Z to get out to wide. So I'm gonna just pop back into my color wheels and I'll use the offset. Whereas these are stretching the color channels by adding or removing or compressing them into different brightness ranges. The offset is just pushing towards a neutral channel and allowing the others to move with it. So if I push towards blue, you see it's getting a very soft introduction of that blue feel to it. And that's helping enormously with the shot. Now, if I turn off loop playback and play through again, you can see that the next shot is the close up of the, the wide. So it would make an awful lot of sense to use this grade as the starting point to work this shot. How can I do that? Well, the easiest way is just park on the shot you want. Well, there's loads of ways to do it, but the one way <laughs> is to park on the shot and right click and grab that as a still. That's now in the still, I could call it my look. And now if I want to apply that to this shot, I can just right click on that still and go apply grade. And you ooh, right click on that still and go apply, apply. I keep on hitting the wrong button, apply grade. So there you go. No, no, it's not on there. Apply grade. There we go. Good. So now if I press play, and play through, you can see that that grade's gone onto that one as a starting point. If I think he's too bright, I think he probably is a little bit too bright. By the end of this shot, he's in the darkness, so I need to set that up. So I would option S, add another serial node, and of course I can adjust that just by taking down my Luma curve and just taking a little bit of heat out of that. Let's play through, and that's cutting better. Another way of transferring a grade, if I go to this next shot, um, you can see that's clearly from this first shot that I hit. So it's an, again, it's another one where it's been shot similar time of day. Now this is my favorite way of grabbing a grade from one shot to another. All I need to do is go over to the grade I want, park on the shot that I want the grade on, and then use the middle mouse button to click on the grade I want to grab. And you can see I've instantly transferred the whole of that grade across to this shot. Really quick to propagate grades and uh, starting points and looks and so on through the shots in that way. So all good. So now the next shot we're moving on to is we're going to look at secondary correction. And secondary correction is defined by when you're just working on a part of the image rather than the overall image. So if I go to this shot, it's already got a grade on it. I can turn that on and off. So we've already got a starting point for this shot. And the director wants me to uh, work on these pipes at the top, change maybe the saturation and the brightness of this red pipe that we're looking at. So again, I don't want to work on that node, so I'll do option S to work in a node, and maybe I'll tab it and call it secondary to just get an idea of what I've done in there. Be aware when you have done any work, you see you get little icons set to the node to say what you, where you've worked in that node, just to let you know that you have done some work in there and what type of task you might have uh, approached. Now to do this, I'm gonna use the color curves to make this adjustment to the, uh, to the bars here. Um, and so I'll, I can reset that curve, but I'm not actually gonna use this custom curve. I'm gonna use um, one of these other curves. Now, just to explain what you're looking at here, because it's quite confusing initially. These curves are set up to take one input value and then change it by the output value. So if I want to change the color of something I could and base it on the color that it is, I can use hue versus hue. If I want to desaturate a color, I can use hue versus sat. And if I want to change the brightness of a color, I can use hue versus luma. So they're all set for a different input and an output. 
So let's look at that. If I go to my hue versus sat curve, and this will allow me to adjust the saturation of this pipe, one thing you should know is there is an idiosyncrasy when you just click on the pipe to sample it, and it basically picks up a very narrow range and sets three points in my graph. Now, just to explain what's going on here, that point and that point are protecting all these colors from being influenced. This one is the one that it gave me as a sample of that red. But you can see it's quite an acute sample. It's not giving me a good result. It's, it's looking problematic. And that's because it's such an acute sample of this red range. By the way, it's a flat line, but why is it moving on both sides? Well, that's because it's actually not a flat line. It's actually a color wheel chopped around the red point. You can see red over here and red over here. So it's chopped around the red point and flattened off to make it easy to add points into it and raise them and lower them to change the values. I'll just reset that because there's a better way of getting that sample of red. If I just click on the red swatch underneath, it will give me the broadest values of that red channel. So now when I use the midpoint, I get a much softer push or reduce, add saturation or reduce saturation. And it's much more working across the whole shot. So that's good. I've got my extra saturation. You can see it's affecting all of these uh, pillars and anything that's red in the shot, but I could limit it with um, the windows that we have and what we call garbage part masking techniques. And we've got a lot of those. I'll show you some of them soon. But if I wanted to now darken the pole, I could go to uh, hue versus loom, again, hit the swatch. And now if I pull down, you see, I'm now darkening that red. The other thing I could do, of course, in here, if I go back to that hue versus sat uh, formula, is if I wanted to take out and kill, kill off some of this blue specular stuff that's coming from the lights, maybe it's interfering with the look, I can take these points down, and you see now I'm desaturating all the other colors uh, in the shot, apart from that red channel. So it's desaturating the car, but keeping the looking nice and punchy and poppy. Cool. Um, now the next shot we're going to, um, we're going to do a little bit more advanced work on. By the way, before I jump out of this one, just to show you, we're all, all that I've showed you up until now is all in the free version of Resolve. You can download that. I have the studio version of Resolve working here. And one of the things you get, apart from things like noise reduction, which are kind of valuable in most jobs um, you get a lot of OFX plugins I've got an OFX library of all my plugins here some of these are free but most of them are watermarked but just to show you one and how I can deploy it very simply if I go option s the rules are one node per OFX plugin so if I wanted to add a light effect the director maybe wants me to accentuate these lights I could go in there and type diffraction there's my aperture diffraction uh, plugin, and I'm just literally drag it and drop it onto the node, and you can see it's instantly kicked in. It's also swapped me straight from the library to all the settings that I can play with to make this uh, uh, bespoke. I've got, if I double click, I can open up the isolation controls. I could go and pick, pick up my pipette and maybe choose a color for the, for the, uh, sparkles on that and everything is all animatable in here so if I went to my rotation area here go back to the front I can set a keyframe at that point on the rotation value just go down to the other end and change it and the second keyframe will come in so now if I play through you can see I've got that momentum behind the specular lights to just push out give it a little bit more momentum on that car. Very stylized, but very easy to do. And of course, option D turns off all the nodes. So you can see before and after what we had. Good. So the next shot we're working on, we're gonna do some more advanced uh, secondary correction on this. The director actually likes the shot, um, likes the warmth of it, but actually wants to go the other way on the look side. Um, so we're gonna, Again, add a node, option S, downstream. And this one, I'm going to make that real heavy look feel. So I'm just going to type look. 
uh, hit tab and get to my node label and type look. And now I'm going to develop the look that the director wants. Now the director wants to go cool. So I'm going to go very blue in my gain. I'm going to go to cyan or, uh, in my gamma. So I'm really killing it off in terms of all that warmth that was there. And maybe I'll go to red in the shadows to just bring back some of that, that warmth. But now we've got a problem. If I now wanted to uh, bring back her skin tones, which the director wants, if I turn that off, they want all those lovely skin tones back. Where do I do that? If I go back to this node, I can push back in color, but then it's going to be fed into this blue filter and clipped out. Or I could add another node downstream and then I'm working off the top of this blue look and trying to reverse it. So that's neither of those are great ideas, which is why we've got a, a much better solution. If I add a mixer node, so if I right click on this node and go add node, add parallel, which is a mixer configuration, when I do that, what happens is I get a mixer node that combines the two elements together. But importantly, this one with all its good colors and so on is now being fed to two nodes concurrently. So I can work different looks in both nodes and combine them together. Now by default, parallel nodes are neutral to each other. So until I change some color or bring back saturation or do something in this node, I'm not gonna see its effect on anything. As soon as I go to my saturation and start bringing it back, you see I'm bringing back all that color because it all sits in here and it's working over the top. Now, just as a little point to point out, if I change any value in Resolve and I want to reset it to its default, double click on the name next to it and it will bring it back to its default. So good. I'm not going to do that yet. First, I only want to isolate where her face is to work on that so that the colors that I bring back from here are only there. And to do that, I'm going to use one of my windows. On my third menu along in the middle panel here are all my windows. I've got infinite amounts of windows. They can interact with each other. Um, and I can draw the ultimate mask in here. Of course, I've got Fusion, which does, does amazing rotoscoping and so on as well. Now, I could just use a simple circle window. I'll take the soft off. I can move it over here, maybe change the shape of it, rotate it. And this would probably get away with it if I added soft to it. Um, but I just wanted to point out that any standard window can also be turned into a bezier. I can go in here and go convert to bezier, and then I can just add points and adjust the bezier handles and get the angle I want. As it is, I'm just going to reset that window and I'm going to use a Bezier tool and show you how, how good this tool is. So I'm just going to activate my Bezier tool, roll in on the picture and get nicely in. I want to isolate her face. So to add a point, I just click. And if I click and drag in the direction I want the point to arrive in, it will give me the Bezier handles to be able to finesse that. And I'm just going to quickly just doodle around this bit get some of that and then when I see the circle I can close the shape and now I've got that shape if I want to see what I've created I can click on my highlight control and there I'm seeing that as a desaturation uh, and the selection I can also see it as a black and white shape alpha channel up, up here so if I want to add soft to that now I can add a general state of soft I can also add an inside soft and an outside soft to really finesse what I'm getting there and then when I turn off the highlight control now, I'm in good shape. If I go to my tools in the viewer menu, I can go to that power window and see how that's working. Now, if I, the last thing I need to do, if I bring back in the color, let's do that. I can bring in that color. So let's have a look. That's nice. Maybe I'll add some contrast into her face so we're really getting it moody. I won't bring so much color into it. But I can generate color. I can push it to red. I can push warm it up um, I'll bring out slightly more and maybe I'll accentuate that contrast even more if I go shift Z if I do shift and tilde that will hide the overlay so I can hide and reveal that so I've got a bit bit strong on that and maybe I'll just take it that way for good effect so something like that okay now if I want to I've obviously got to, next thing I've got to do is capture the motion because my mask isn't moving currently with the, with the object. So 
that's tracking and we've got that in the next menu along this is my tracking menu it's great for lots of things at the moment it's set up to track on all these parameters it will do a fine job uh, probably um, all I need to do is know that it's a cloud-based tracker so essentially it's going to throw as many points into that shape as it needs to capture the motion if I press play to track forward there you go all the points are now used and you can see that window's locked to her face very easily if i hide the overlay which is drawing my attention to that so if i turn that off uh, oh i'll go back and loop playback there you go we can see that it's working nicely to put her face in that context now if i want to work the overall shot again i can go to that mixer node and go option s to add a node and now this could be driving an overall contrast into the shot where I'm darkening off him and maybe pulling it down a little bit, uh, maybe desat a little bit across everything and I'm in good shape. The last thing I'm gonna maybe do is add another node and this one I will just make a standard circle vignette like I, I was making before. Maybe open that up and give it a lot of soft and now by default, when you look at the key of that, it's an additive key. So we're always working inside the white of any of these windows. If I want to invert it, I can invert it there. And now when I'm looking at that, I'm gonna be working where the white is so I can be darkening off around her and just clipping out this guy. One of the things we do as colorists is try and avoid and get, make sure everybody's looking at the same part of the screen. So we don't want them looking at the back of his head we're really looking to get her that those eyes to do all the hard lift, heavy lifting in the story. So as you can see, we've got an, an immense set of uh, grading tools. The tracking tool comes in, the tracking functionality within these windows is enormous and gives us loads of control. Now, as a last thing, I'm just gonna drop back into here. The last shot I've got here is, um, a comp shot, I'm actually gonna do a sky replacement. If I hit D in the editing page, I can disable the foreground shot just to see what I've got underneath it. And of course, if I was doing a real true composite, I could be doing the compositing side in Fusion and then feeding any of those mats that I've created in Fusion directly into the color page at an advanced level. So we've got real integration between the rooms uh, and Fusion has some awesome tools for isolating objects. If I go into the color page, um, <clears throat> at this moment, now this shot's gonna be a tricky one to key or to isolate because of pretty much all of it's very close to a, the same, same grades of white. I've, I've done a, uh, a, an initial starting grade on it, so I'll add a node to work downstream of that. And now in this instance, I've had a very helpful guy if I open my media pool I've had uh, a fusion operator create me the ultimate map now if I need to use any external maps be they generated by 3d apps or whatever they've been made in I can just simply get them from the media pool and drag them into the comp and now that's an external map for me I'll hide my media pool away and if I want to use that on this node I can just plug it into the blue input into the node which is the alpha channel input and there you go, you can see the key kicking in. If I decided to push the sky to blue now, I've got, a, I've got the ability to do that. So yeah, it still looks very flat though. So the director would like me to replace that sky. Um, so I'll just reset that look for now. Now uh, to do that, I need to not only um, isolate this, but I, instead of using this mat just to place a color on the shot, I actually have to punch a hole to see in the base level A for channel to get to this bottom layer. So to do that, I'm gonna add an alpha output back into the timeline and take the key that I've got and plug that back into the timeline too. So now, if I uh, look at that, you can see now I'm seeing that background plate. I need to invert the key. So I'll go to my keying menu. Here's where I'm seeing all my keying adjustments capabilities and I'll just invert that so that now we've got it around the right way. And if I wanted to, obviously my sky needs a scaling adjustment, so I could go in here and zoom that up to get that so it's filling the space. So now if I play through, we've got a nice replacement sky. It's not perfect, we need to do some work still because it's not moving and the foreground is. 
So we've got to get that working. And obviously it's not matching this shot. One of the nice tricks is I can select the shot I want to grade, right click and go shot match to this clip and it will give it the tonality of what it's picking up from underneath. I can still work it independently, but they, that now is feeling much more like a, a, a sky that might be there. Now, the last bit I'm going to do is just grab the motion off of this foreground to put onto the background object. And then that's very easy to do. I'm just going to use a temporary window. I'm just going to create a little circle shape, take off of the softness and scale it down a bit. I'll use this signs motion to capture the motion of it. So all I've got to do is pick it over the sign. I'll go to my tracking menu I'm on the first frame. So I'll just press play to track forward. Now I've captured that motion. I don't want to apply it to this object. In fact, I don't want that circle anymore. But if I go back into my tracker menu, there's all the tracking data. And I can go into that menu and go copy track data, which now keeps that very usefully. And now this is the element that I need to put that tracking data on. Now to do that, we've got to go through a couple of steps. I've got to switch to my stabilizer rather than uh, windows. And remember to switch back when you're trying to track a window again, because it stays on the stabilizer. And this isn't actually the stabilizer I want. This is the new one, but there's the classic stabilizer and that's the one I need. If I go in there and pick up the classic stabilizer, it's ready for the same sort of data. So now I can go in there and paste that track data back in. Now by default, it's, it's using that motion, uh, but I want to invert that motion to put it on the background. And to do that where it says strong, all I've got to do is get in there and type a minus figure. So I'm going to invert that strength value. And now the last thing I have to do to make the effect work is hit the stabilize button. And you can see now as I play through, we've got a nice shot. And of course, because I've just done that, it's instantly available in my timeline to work through. So hopefully in this flying visit to Resolve, you've seen the core competence of all the tools in the color area. They're the same in the editing, same in the fusion page and same in Fairlight. So you've got a one stop shop without any round tripping. Now, obviously, uh, you've got Adobe, Avid, all of the players have their strengths and weaknesses. All our ed, all my trainers would argue with me that their toy is best, uh, but I tend to think my one is. So if you've been inspired to get involved with Resolve and get down, then download the free version and maybe book up for a couple of days course where I can get you through all the fundamentals of it. Um, we do editing and color grading courses in, and fusion in uh, for Resolve. But remember, yeah, as I say, we do all the training for all the different manufacturers. So if you want to get certified for Avid or certified for Adobe After Effects, just check out the website and find out when the next virtual training is. Um, that's it. So thank you very much for giving up your time to come along to this. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. And uh, yes, yeah, stay safe and well, people. Okay, cheers.